why are we seeing such a slowdown in activists investing this year? I think there's probably three major reasons. One is, you know, and all of which sort of lead to the conclusion that they're getting stronger headwinds. It's getting tougher to do. First of all, these hedge funds are much larger and there's a lot more of them. Uh, in the last count, there were some 213 activists out there. In the uh, proverbial olden days, when actually Carl Icahn, you know, launched this as a raider on TWA, mm -hmm. um, and you know, now they become corporate, now they become activists, then they were corporate raiders. Um, but, the, but the reality is that, you know, you could never go after a General Electric, which they have, a Microsoft, which they have, and win, and even Apple. Now, the conversations there, though, are much more genteel. Icahn invites Tim Cook over for dinner. Right. It's not exactly a threat to oust, oust the board. Um, but, you know, the size, as they've gotten bigger, has, has required more elephant hunting. The second issue is also the politics of it. Um, the first phase of the activist cycle is easy. Pay a bigger dividend. Give me a board seat easy things to do like that when you start getting into the in you know into the next phase where it's shut that division down uh, you know move you know move this move this uh, production to mexico and your investors in many many cases are institutional for example in the united case um, you know, you look at CalSTRS has 4.1 billion, the California Teachers Pension Fund, 4.1 billion in activists. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, United's got a 2.9 million square foot facility in San Francisco. That's expensive with 3,500 people. So you're going to fire them and move it to Mexico? I don't think so. Not with CalSTRS on your board. Right. So as you said, the, perhaps the low-hanging fruit has been picked. Greg, when you look at the numbers, you are with Bloomberg Intelligence, you've been doing the number crunching on all this. Mm -hmm. What sectors are more susceptible still to activist campaigns? than others. I mean, uh, Fabio told us about how there are some genteel campaigns in the tech industry. They haven't all stayed genteel. No, they haven't. And the technology sector has been the, the prime target this year and it has for the most of the, the past five years. I think one of the things with technology, right, just as disruption brings new players to the market, at the same time it gives activists an open when companies fall behind. And I think one of the important things to, to also note, echoing the, the sentiments of, of harder battles, is more of the companies that activists have been targeting mm -hmm. have had poor governance and particularly poor voting rights um, structures and specifically around their entrenched boards, which may make battles much more difficult for activist investors going forward. So if that's the case, um, are we going to get to a point where activist investors, Fabio, would need to change their pay structure, the, the 2 and 20 right now that they demand well, uh, at hedge funds, for instance? I think the 2 and 20 really is something that, that uh, you know, you can cover it around and say, you know, that a large part of this, quote unquote, is because, you know, you're facing these headwinds, et cetera, et cetera. But the other reality is that a lot of them don't hedge the positions at all. And, or, and, and so what you've got is a correlation. They're all in, basically. They're all in, and you're all long. And when you're all long, a huge slab of your returns is the market. So when everyone says, gee, what a genius, he or she was up you know, 20%, if the market was up 18%, you should be paying 20% of the upside on the 2% of alpha, uh. not on the entire market. And if you look at it, actually, the activist index has a higher correlation over the, one of the time periods we studied, a higher correlation to the mar market than Fidelity Magellan Fund. And that's, you know, that's a real issue. And they've underperformed in down markets and underperformed in up markets. At some point, it also makes it hard to make a case from a portfolio perspective. Right. It's that incremental gain that, that everyone wants to look at here. Greg, we mentioned this with Michael Sasso earlier when we were talking about United. Are activist campaigns distractions for companies? I mean, while the board focuses on improving shareholder returns, what kind of operational improvements are actually being made or can be made? I think there's no doubt that it's distraction. I mean, management has to respond. They can't ignore it. Um, but very often, I think activists are, are bringing good points to the table. That's something that Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, made. So even when he told companies in a recent letter that they need to focus on long-term performance, he still acknowledged that 39% of the time, BlackRock voted with activist proposals. So, I mean, I think, you know, very clearly um, there's, there's work there, but activists are bringing new ideas to the table, recommending good ideas many of the time. Okay, and final question to you, Fabio. As we enter this next stage of activist campaigns, very quickly, what will it look like? I think you're going to be seeing more people moving to Europe. I think it's an excellent point. For example, BlackRock has actually done a full-on web page about a company in Hong Kong called G Resources mm -hmm. that was doing some really silly things. So even Larry Fink has gone activist. I think what you're going to see is more of these what I would call occasional activists. And Larry Fink is a highly reluctant activist. Mm -hmm. um, and you've also seen people move to Europe. Uh, an outfit called Schoenfeld Management managed to get Vivendi to pay out an extra billion dollars in dividends. It's harder and it's more entrenched over there, but that's the next frontier. And China and Asia is, is where they're headed next, where these family companies don't realize you're actually publicly traded. There's a new sheriff. In